mandele mandole le te amram bandrosi ada la madre bless you. Lord, there's no one like you in all the earth. Your love is like the ocean. Father, God, we bless you. We glorify you. Tonight, Father, God, we thank you for your word. We declare your word shall not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which you called it to do. Glory to God. And we bless you, Lord. Come on, just lift your hands toward heaven and bless him just for another minute. We bless you, Lord God. Father, receive this, our worship. May it be a sweet smell unto you. May it be well-pleasing to you, Father God. And we bless you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Go ahead and give the Lord a great big shout. Can you do that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and turn around and greet two or three, four, five, six, seven, eight or nine, ten or eleven, twelve, thirteen or fourteen. Tell somebody hello. Tell them you're glad to see them. Then you can be seated, praise God. God. Everybody blessed? Amen. You know, I was just thinking about this when we're singing. We, we bless you, Lord. Remember what that word bless means? It means empower to prosper. So really, when we're worshiping him and we're saying we bless you, Lord, we're empowering him to prosper. You say, well, does he need to prosper? Well, you know what? He has things he wants to do in your life. And if you're resisting that, then he's not able to prosper in your life. So that's why you ought to, ought to remind yourself that once in a while, praise God. Well, we'll go ahead and let those that are, are uh, ministering in our children's ministry, we'll let those guys get a head start and go ahead and get ready. Going to have a great service tonight. That I know. Glory to God. Well, we'll go ahead and let children, we'll let you guys head out. I know Miss Brenda, who leads praise and worship, is uh, back there tonight. When I say back there, I mean right that direction. And so I know that you'll have a great time. 
be lots of great, good things going on, praise God. Well, glory. Well, I, I, I talked to George Cavour today, and George said to tell all of you hello. He's looking forward to seeing you, looking forward to being with you. He said, whenever I get to hang around with you talking about Debbie and I, and of course that just rubs off on you also, but he said, I always get refreshed when I'm with you guys. Because, you know, we're not, you know, we don't usually wear the collar. We don't usually, uh, you know, uh, well, anyway. I've been around some Anglicans, and they are just a little bit stuffy, but not all. But uh, in his position, you know, he has to kind of hold a certain line, and um, when uh, he can just, as he would say, let his hair down, which if any of you have seen a picture of him on Facebook, you would understand, let your hair down. But uh, he put this long wig on for his Facebook picture. But anyway, he just, you know, he likes to have fun. And so, you know, the whole time we're together, he's either making us laugh or we're making him laugh. And he said, uh, you know, he's looking forward to it and know it's going to be a great time. So he said to tell you hello from across the pond. Um, tonight I want to talk to you for just a few minutes on the subject of prayer uh, I, I've been doing some study and some research for uh, quite some time um, I don't yet know if it's going to turn into a book it might at least turn into a, to a little teaching syllabus or something but uh, I've been studying out and just what kind of came to my my mind one day is um, leadership lessons in the life of Moses and in, in doing some study in there every time I get over index I can't go anywhere but Exodus Numbers Deuteronomy I'm just right in those areas studying the life of Moses and I'm finding out some really you know tremendous things but um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you tonight about is just about our prayer life because uh, I, I have a feeling that we all just need a little bit of encouragement in that area. You know, uh, did you notice just today, just here singing and worshiping the Lord for just that little bit of time that we did, how all that other stuff just doesn't seem to make as much difference, you know? You know, when you can uh, shout unto the Lord and when you can just honor Him for a little bit, you know, I, I love to get over singing in the Spirit. Because, you know, when you sing, let me just talk to you a second about singing in the Spirit. When you sing in the Spirit, you're touching two areas of your life at once. You know, you're touching your spirit man, of course. That's where that's coming from. But you have to understand, music always touches the soul, the emotion. And so when you're singing in the Spirit, you're touching two of the three. You know, you are a spirit, you live in a body, and you possess a soul. And... And so when you're singing in the Spirit, you're touching two of the three. And then I guess if you were to take off and dance a little bit, you'd touch all three, wouldn't you? Which probably would be pretty good for some of us anyway. But um, it's always, I just always enjoy, and you know, sometimes you get over there and you just don't want to come back, you just want to stay there, just sing the whole time. And some of those, we've done those in the past, and I'm sure we'll do some more of those in the future, just where we start singing in the Spirit and you just... Because you know what? I just happened to think of this. Some of the times that we've done that, just singing the Spirit all service, it did touch the physical because people were healed. People were so set free that they just, you know, couldn't get out of the building. And, um, you know, we believe more of that will come along. Amen? Because we ought to be joyous, happy Christians, right? Pastor, how in the world can you be happy and joyous with what's going on in the world? Because we're in this world, but we're not of it. That's how. And I march to a different drum. And the drummer's name is Jesus the Christ. Well, anyway, prayer. Let's get over to that. Um, go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll start there. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about prayer tonight. A couple things that I want to talk to you about. Kind of sharpening our prayer skills just a little bit. And um, just see where we go from here. We might talk about this several weeks, but... Uh, we'll see. Ephesians chapter 6. 
and then we'll get over in. I told you about Moses, so you, you can just guarantee we'll get to Exodus 4. This is over with. You say, is there anything in, there in my Exodus about prayer? Oh, yeah. Exodus chapter 6, and let's, uh, just for the sake of... Uh, Ephesians, Exodus, you know, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It, um, yeah, that e-book, the, the New Testament e-book. Ephesians, that's right. <laughs> um, oh, why not? Let's just start in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I've been praying about doing a, an in-depth study on the book of Ephesians. And we may get to it here before, before the year's out anyway. There's some really good stuff in the book of Ephesians. But anyway, in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, in other words, after having said all this, let me cap all this with this very good and very uh, important point. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in who? Be strong in who? Now, it, did he run for president? Did, it, did he run for governor? Is he a congressman? Is he uh, one of our delegates somewhere? Is he a police officer? No, he kind of is a little bit further up the ladder than that, right? Be strong in who? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. Put on the whole, full, complete armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Against who? Against the devil. Notice here again, I'm going to say it this way again. Uh, did he say the president? You know, our fight is not against our president. You know, we have a president who uh, confesses to be a Christian. We, we have no reason to not believe that. So we pray for him. We believe God's best for him. We believe he'll make all the right decisions. But our fight is not with our president. It's not with Congress. I, we fight against the wiles of the devil. The wiles there is talking about methods. It's talking about the mode of operation that the enemy has. And we might get to it in a minute. But For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, what do you do? Do you, do you complain? Do you worry? You stand. Having done all to stand, stand. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having, uh, your, uh, having on the, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always. Notice something here, and, and I've done a teaching on this. Uh, we should be able to, to have access to that. I'll teach it again soon. But um, notice that all these elements, uh, what we call the armor of God, uh, are to get us into a position to where we can do what? Where we can pray. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and being watchful unto this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, here's the thought that I want you to see just for tonight. We could spend three or four months just right there on the armor of God. But I want you to see here that we prepare ourselves. We prepare ourselves to pray. Now, once again, the word prayer or pray in the Greek is an interesting Greek word. It's the Greek uh, root word pros, P-R-O-S, pros. And pros simply means this. We've got a lot of goofy ideas about prayer, but prayer, pros, simply means this, face-to-face, nose-to-nose, elbow-to-elbow, shoulder-to-shoulder, toe-to-toe. It means this. And so any time that we get like this with Father God, we are in prayer. But then the Bible tells us here, that we are to pray with all prayer. Actually, in the Greek, it could say it this way, all kinds of prayer. So this scripture tells us that there are different kinds of prayer. You know, there is the prayer of worship, prayer of praise. And that is 
getting like this and telling God praises, telling God how great he is and all the great things he's done. The prayer of worship is getting like, like this with Father God and telling him just who he is and how awesome he is and how much you love him. There's a difference. The difference is things. You don't worship God with things. You worship God with your heart. Uh, things that, you, you know, when, when you're in worship, it, it's not about things. God, you're good because you did this and this for me. That's praise. But anyway, uh, and then so then there's the prayer of supplication, and that's the prayer of asking. There's a prayer of agreement where you are agreeing with someone else. There's different kinds of prayer. But I want you to also see this, and this is what I want to get to tonight, is that we need to realize that there are some times that we just need um, not a di necessarily a different kind of prayer, but a different kind of fervency in prayer. You know, I always say this, that, you know, the Bible says pray always, and so I'm always in an attitude of prayer. I'm always, uh, and when I say always, I'd like to say 24-7, but I'm not there yet. But I, 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 um, my desire is to always recognize and acknowledge God's presence with me and always recognize and acknowledge the fact that God is there wanting to help. That's kind of the first step of prayer. But that's not really, it is prayer, but it's more fellowship. So we, I guess we could call it the prayer of fellowship. You know, if I just hang out with Willie all the time, and I, you know, every once in a while I poke him, and every little bit he pokes me back. wonder who'd poke harder. But anyway, um, that would be fellowship. We wouldn't get a whole lot accomplished. Have you ever watched two guys just stand there talking to each other, and they just poke each other and just kind of giggle and act real goofy? <laughs> um <clears throat> We wouldn't get a lot done, but we could say, we hung out today. Yeah, I spent some time with Willie. What'd you do? Well, oh, we just told jokes and laughed and whatever. I mean, it wasn't anything important. Uh, and that's kind of like fellowship with Father God, but there are times where we have to go deeper. You know, I hear this a lot, and, it, and if, if you've just said this to me, this, you didn't trigger it. This, this is something I've been thinking about for a while. But I hear people say this all the time. Well, God told me to do this. And, you know, I said this to you the other day. When somebody, as soon as somebody says to me, well, God told me, uh, you know, it pretty much just puts a period at the end and we're done. Because, you know, you just, Carl Stewart, he says it this way, you, you, you pulled the God card. Um, and, and, and once you do that, you know, you're kind of like, well, well, you know, if you heard from God, then what am I supposed to say? But, you know, a lot of times we say we've heard from God a little bit later on, we realize we didn't. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that tonight for just a few minutes about making sure that you're, you're hearing from God, making sure that you're clear. Because, you know, there are some situations, there are some situations that you better know that you've heard from God. There's some things, now, yeah, I realize, yeah, it should be everything, right? You know, but if... You know, you say, well, I feel like the Lord told me to drive down this street. And you drive down that street, and you find out that wasn't what you were supposed to do. Um, you know, it may not, if, as long as it's not a life or death issue, it may not be a big deal. And so if you miss God a little bit, you know, Brother Hagin used to say it this way. Before you start praying for your million dollars, why don't you work on your prayer life for a pair of socks? Because, you know, a whole lot of folks have never gotten that pair of socks, but yet they're working on their million. And they don't have anything to base anything on. And, but anyway, so the point being that sometimes we just got to know that we know that we know. And, and there are some indications. Now, uh, I, I said this when somebody says to me, well, God said, and so I pretty much say we're done. If I have the kind of relationship with somebody... You know, like my sons in the Lord, if they say to me, and they have, most of them, you know, Pastor, if you see me going down the wrong road, you better jerk my chain. And, and they expect me to do that, and so I do. Sometimes it makes them mad, but they get over it. But they've asked me to do it, so I do. And sometimes they'll say, well, God said do this, and I'll say, prove it to me. Or where did you find that? 
that doesn't line up with scripture so I know that's not God I mean you know that's easy it's easy to when when something they say God said something and you can find a scripture that absolutely contradicts what they just said it's easy to say no God didn't say that well God told me to buy that car well I can't find a scripture that says don't buy that car and so unless I just absolutely know something well it's going to take four jobs to pay for that car and I can just tell you right now that God's not into people about getting four jobs people that only sleep an hour a day uh, are out of can I say this out of the will of God because you're supposed to get blessed sleep but anyway so since we've read in Ephesians now let's go to Exodus <clears throat> Exodus 24 Exodus 24 is the uh, is the story where in the midst of all that the children of Israel are doing God says to Moses come up the mountain with me so I want to I show you that for a second and I want to talk to you for just a couple minutes and let's see if we can see something now remember this about the Old Testament how many of you just love the Old Testament you know there are whole denominations that say and, and, and whole groups of people that say well we're, we're New Testament or New Covenant Christians and so toss the Old Testament away because it doesn't apply to us but the Old Testament are types and shadows for us today and you can bring the Old Testament over into the New Testament you know a lot of things like for instance how many of you believe in praise and worship you know very little about praise and worship in the New Testament the majority of it you're gonna find in the life of David which is Old Testament now tithing people say well it's in the old covenant so we do away with tithing, tithing now that we're in the new covenant but you can bring it over you can bring it over into the gospels you can bring it over into the life of Paul and so you can bring those things over as a matter of fact that's the way you determine if something's a doctrine you find out you, you can really call something a doctrine if you can find it in the Old Testament you can find it in the life of Jesus and you can find it over in the life of Paul. If you can't find those three places, then, you know, we got issues. And any time, you know, in all the, the work that I did um, in the Bible school and working on my Ph.D. and all those things, that was the very first thing. That you, in order to prove a point, you had to be able to find it in those three places. So don't throw the Old Testament away. There's lots and lots and lots of good things but you do have to look at it through the sunglasses the shaded glasses of the blood of Jesus realizing that some things in the Old Testament have been fulfilled and brought over into the new covenant by way of the blood of Jesus and it's different for instance we don't have to keep all 613 laws and I yes I agree thank you Lord you know we have to keep one that is the commandment of love that's a whole lot better than 613 wouldn't you think but anyway uh, so there are some things that don't come up that don't cross into the new covenant but you just got to be able to know that when the blood of Jesus is applied that it took care of some things but anyway so here in, in Exodus chapter 24 and let's just start here for the sake of time tonight in verse 12 so that's Exodus not Ephesians but Exodus 24 and verse 12 then the Lord said to Moses come up to me on the mountain and be there <clears throat> notice something it says come up to me on the mountain and be there and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written and you shall teach them notice it doesn't say come up to the mountain and I will give you it says come up to the mountain and be there We'll look at that in just a second so Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God and he said to the elders wait here for us until we come back to you indeed Aaron and her are with you if any man have a difficulty let him go to them remember just if you want to write in your Bible or make a little mark that's the this is the mistake that caused the golden calf right here 
and I could say it this way for leadership it's real important to always remember to always go back to what God said to you you remember back when Jethro told Moses the thing that he does is not good because he was judging the people from morning to night and he was wore out and he was wearing the people out and Jethro said no you need to get people to help you and so God said choose out from among you uh, elders and let them judge and the big issues you bring to him well he didn't say that right did he when he told the, that he's going up the mountain he didn't say to the elders now y'all take care of everything and if you have a big issue you bring it to Aaron and her he just said if you have any issue bring it to the two of them so that's where he messed up that's where the golden calf came from because the, the leadership was out of place now I want you to just think about this just for a second because think about the fact that before Moses went up the mountain what was he dealing with every little issue parents you know about this when one child will come and say you know so and so threw paper at me and so I threw water back and then I threw my soup and then I threw whatever you know and before long you got World War III and it started out over a piece of paper but that's the kind of stuff that Moses dealt with because he judged every matter how many of you know he was ready for vacation how many of you know that he had a lot of stuff in his head I mean you just can't you just can't stop dealing with issues and it be gone that stuff's still rolling around in your head which is important I'll show it to you in a second um, <clears throat> So verse 15, then Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain. Now look that word cloud up in the Hebrew and you know what it says? Cloud. Uh, that which obscures the view. And so a cloud, an actual cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. Now the glory, the word glory in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word kabod. And it means the heavy, weighty, presence of God the splendor of God and so there was a cloud that covered it from the natural but within the cloud was the glory now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So they're down in the valley looking up, and all they see is they see the cloud, and they see light, and they see what looks like an all-consuming fire. It's why, the, you know, after a little bit, they thought, well, Moses, he's burned up, so there's no reason for us to wait on him. And so that's why they asked Aaron to, build the calf, or to, to mold the calf. Um, <clears throat> now the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel so Moses went into look at this so Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain and Moses was in the mountain or on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights verse 1 of 25 then 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 the Lord spoke to Moses now I have a question how many of you are able to wait six days on any one subject before you get an answer now I'm not saying you have to don't misunderstand just stay with me for a second but I, I want this to kind of start to, think, to go in your mind for just a little bit you know we'll ask God a question and if we don't have an answer in 32 seconds we're coming up with the answer for him and not everybody, because some of you are looking at me like, uh, uh, not me. I don't move until God says move. Yep, okay. <laughs> but now notice this, because I want you to see this in context, and I want you to see this. How many days was Moses on the mountain before God spoke? N no, six. When God spoke to him, he, he stayed 40 days. Excuse me, that was, that, that was a little bit blind to you. But he was six days on the mountain the seventh day he God said come in here and Moses stepped into the Shekinah the Kabod the heavy weighty presence splendor of God 
Not the first day through the sixth day, but on the seventh day. Now, if you know anything about biblical numerology, and you do, because we talk about this, you, you, you should immediately start thinking about those two numbers, six and seven. The number six refers to the number of completion of man. The number seven refers to the number of completion of God, fullness. And so we could say six is the fullness of man, seven is the fullness of God. Remember we've got 666, which is the Antichrist, the number of, of the Antichrist, and that is the three that are trying, the, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet are trying to be just like God, and they miss it by one. Each one of them can't quite come up to it. In the fullness of all they can do, they still come up short. But this number six here is interesting because it gives us something we need to think about for just a moment. And that is this, that six is the completion of man. Now, in prayer, there are some things that are very, very vital that we have absolutely the word of the Lord. When people come to me and they say, I've prayed about this, I say, how long? You know, when we prayed about coming up here to to Roanoke from Raleigh, we prayed down there, we got away. We spent three days in a hotel somewhere between here and there, Debbie and I. Actually, we were were on our way to, um, to Southern Pines. Figured we could hear God really good there on the golf course at Southern Pines. We weren't going to play golf. We were just going to go there, you know. All those, well, never mind. But, and we got there and the hotels were all booked up, so we just started heading this way. And we asked the guy into Roanoke before we found a hotel where we could stay. And so we stayed three days just praying. We didn't, you know, we'd eat. We didn't watch television. We just stayed before Father God till we got an answer. And then, you know, we had several other opportunities for confirmation and so forth, but the answer came in an extended time of waiting on the Lord. But now waiting on the Lord, this number six tells us what that is. And this is what I want you to see tonight. Because so many times when we're praying, I know I keep building up to it, but I, I want you to make sure you get this. When we're praying, we're too quick to try to get an answer. Now, the number of six, the completion of man, we could say it this way, it's the, um, uh, the fulfillment of human reasoning. Because man, the way man thinks and the way man makes decision is with this. So how many of us, when we're praying, do we try to figure out mentally and reason it would be better if we did this because of this. It would be better if we did this, and so forth and so on. You know, the story about going to, uh, coming from Raleigh. Um, you know, we had, when this place came open, if you will, if I can say it this way, uh, you know, we just knew that somebody else was going to be the pastor up here because we had just built our dream home. The church was finally at a place to where it could start growing. We had foundation. Everything was just great. The money was coming in, you know, no issues. Everything was wonderful. And so we just knew that now we could really start going and doing some things. Uh, we loved Raleigh. Uh, at that time, we were, we were more open to the big city than to the not as big a city. Boy, did that change quick. But uh, just all these things in the mental realm, in our reasoning excuse me, pointed to Raleigh. But there still was something down in here that just didn't seem right. And so we kept pressing in to a deeper answer. Because a lot of times we'll get that answer just in our reasoning. Oh, well, you know, we just built our dream house. God gave us this house. It was our dream house. We looked at it for four and a half years. And, you know, it, it, it just had to be. And so... In the natural, you would say, God wouldn't give us this house just to walk off and leave it. That makes sense, doesn't it? It it did to us anyway. But, of course, there's something larger than your reasoning. Because, you know, we can just emotionally, two and two's four, all these things make good sense, but we have to realize that 
what, uh, what Moses had to go through, I'll just tell you what he had to go through. For six days, Moses was on that mountain until he fulfilled human reasoning. In other words, he was on that mountain until all this stuff running through his head finally calmed down so he could really hear from God and not stuff. You know, a lot of times I see a need. You know, I'm a real mercy-motivated person when I can stay in my spot. I, I'm learning to be a little bit more um, balanced, but um, if I see a need, I'm ready to fill it. Hey, just let me add it. Get out of the way. I'll kick doors open. I'm going to do it. But just because there's a need doesn't mean, and it needs to be filled, doesn't mean that you're the one supposed to do it. But because of reasoning and because we can kind of, well, that's just me, that's the way I am, we think that that just makes good sense. And it might, but it's not for us. And there are things that I think we as individuals, as believers, need to be a little bit more cautious and wait until we've gone through the whole gamut, if you will, of human reasoning. Does that make sense to anybody beside me? Because I'm maybe it's just because I'm going through it. But you know, there are so many times where I can say, well, that ought to be the way it should be. For instance, today, I'm praying, and a financial need pops up, and um, at the house, and so I'm thinking, okay, and I had to shift gears. But I'm trying to make that happen. Now, something else about me, if, if there's something wrong, I'll make it happen. I'll fix it. I'm a fixer. I like to make things happen. So just let me, let me add it. I'll figure out a way. Anybody else figure out a way to make things happen? And I found myself coming up with all these solutions while I'm reading this. And then right in the middle of reading all this, then I, I just heard the voice of the Lord say, so which one of these, which one of those solutions that you just came up with came from me? And of course the answer was, none of them. They're all in my head because I can make things happen. You know, I can remember back in the early days in Raleigh, you know, if there wasn't enough money for salary or whatever, I'd just go out and do something. You know, just jump in the truck and go do something. I had a paper route. Rayma graduate, pastor of a church, but I had a paper route. But I did it. But the point being, uh, you know, you can do a lot of things in your head and say it's God. I mean, I had this really cool plan. Just about like that, I had this cool plan laid out of how we could take care of this financial issue. I mean, it was really just that quick. Uh... And it, in times past, I'd have picked up the phone and called the office and said, start this plan. We're going to put this into, into operation. Uh, but I didn't do that this time because I'm learning that I've got to get through human reasoning. So think about this. Moses went up the mountain. On the mountain six days, in the cloud, and then God said, step into the glory. So when we get to the end of human reasoning, now when I say that, you understand what I mean. Sometimes we just got to work through things. You know, I've got my mind, I've got to work it, work it through, work it through, work it through. If there are issues going on, you know, when you guys, and don't, miss, don't take this the wrong way, when you guys are having issues, then I'm still thinking about what can we do. Lord, we need to help those folks. We need to do something for them. And God's just listening for six days. Now, does it take six actual days? No. Because now we're over in the New Covenant. We have the Holy Spirit, and He leads and guides us. But the point still is we still got to come this way. We still got to first come out of the valley and get on the mountain. So let me tell you this real quick first. Don't ever, unless, I mean, you just absolutely have to because of, uh, you know, whatever situation. Um, don't make major decisions in the valley. And sometimes you have to understand. Sometimes, you know, yeah, I've got to get out of the middle of the road. 
there's a truck coming, I got to move. But, you know, the decision should be I'm going to the curb, not I'm moving to Florida. Huh? And so we have to realize and we have to be aware of some of these things because, you know, we say God said. Well, God said to go to Florida. He did? Really? No, he said get on the curb because we start thinking of that with a mind. But the first thing that Moses did is he came out of the valley and went up the mountain. So when you're making a major decision, do as much as you can to get out of the middle of the stuff. You know, when I have a lot of praying to do, when I've got some real you know, things I need to pray through, I don't stay at home. I don't come to the office either. Now, I realize sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. But when you can't, I mean, when you, you know, if you have to work, you have to work, right? I mean, if you think you could call your boss in the morning and say, uh, I've got some major decisions to make, including leaving this company, and so I'm going to take three days off to pray. How many of you believe your boss would say, well, praise God, just be blessed, brother, and go right ahead. And so I realize sometimes you've got to work, okay? So don't, you know. Don't call them, say, Pastor said, I have to take three days off. Um, but, you know, as soon as work is over, rather than coming home and watching four hours of TV, you could back away. But for me, I can, because, well, when I'm making decisions about the church, I can take some time and say, I've got to have three days to pray this through. And so I don't come to the office. I don't... Um, I don't stay at home most of the time because if I'm at home, I see weeds that need to be pulled, I see grass that needs to be cut, I see, you know, whatever that has to be done, and before long I'm doing that instead of, and so here I'm sharing my time with God with the dishwasher or the lawnmower, and people say, oh, I can pray really good with the lawnmower going. Yes, you can, but you can pray better with it off. But the point being that we've got to get out of the valley and get in the, go to the mountain. Now, the mountain is not an actual, you know, 12 o'clock knob or something like that. It is a place away from the stuff of today. So if there's a, a stream you like to go to, if there's a the lake you like to go to, whatever it is you like to do that is just really quiet and peaceful, then you'd be able to get away so that you can hear. Once you've gotten to the mountain, you still have to work through the stuff of your mind. And I've just learned this over this amount of time. I didn't learn it right away. It took some time to learn it. I've made some mistakes. Have I made some mistakes? Hey, that's not nice. Yeah, I have. I have made some mistakes. I have done some things thinking it was God. Come to find out it was me. It made perfect sense, too. It was good, but it just wasn't God. And I, I don't really want to make any more of those mistakes, do you? And so once Moses got up the mountain, then he worked through all this stuff until his mind was quiet. Number six, the completion of man. The completion of mental reasoning. And when he got to that point to where his mind was clear, then God said, come here. And he stepped into the heavy, weighty presence, the splendor of God, which is where we all should be. Because that number seven means the completion, the perfection of God. Everything we need is in that place. We've got to get there. And, you know, the Lord's been talking to me and if you will, kind of nudging at me a little bit about separating myself some more for some of that. And I know he's talking to you too. You know, we have to realize we've got some major decisions ahead of us. When I say we, I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking to me as an individual, you as an individual. There are things in your life. You know, there are things in your life and in mine that are Ishmael's. Anybody ever had an Ishmael? That was man, that was, Ishmael is the fruit of man trying to help God out. 
And some of those Ishmaels grow up and they won't leave home and they eat all your food, you know, all that kind of stuff. You, know. you, you understand what I mean? You know, there are things I bought that I'm still paying for. I'm like, ugh. But anyway, um, there are things that we need to be able to get the right answer on. And my wife is just so great about this. By the way, she's not here tonight because the AT&T man didn't come. So I just wanted you to know. She said, make sure you tell them I'm at, not at church because I'm waiting on, you know, our phone's not working. And so they said, I called them Saturday. They said, well, we'll be there sometime between now and Wednesday evening. And somebody's got to be there. So we've been, somebody's been at the house since Saturday after, well, since Sunday afternoon. So, but anyway. So they promised they'd be here, by, they'd be at the house by 8 o'clock. So I'm believing that she's, but anyway. She said, that's why she said, tell you that. Uh, but you know, right now, we're at a place to where when um, I say something, husbands and wives, maybe you do this. Family members, maybe you do this. When somebody says, I believe God wants us to do this, you kind of give them that look. That's all Pastor Debbie has to do. And I mean, it's not the look, okay? But it is, are you sure? Because if I say, I have heard from heaven and we're going, she's like, hey, I'm right with you. But, you know, we have learned to balance each other and we have learned to uh, help each other. Because I'll say, I believe, I, I think we ought to do this. And she'll go, hmm. Are you sure? And of course, I'm believing one day that she's going to say, I'm believing to do this, and I'm going to be able to say, are you sure? But that hadn't come yet. Because when she says something, I'm like, man, that is so good. I know that's God. But anyway. Um, but it's important to have that. It's important to be able to, if nothing else, just realize where you need to be and ask yourself, are we taking the easy road by saying, God said? And, you know, I'm just like some of the other ministers around. You know, that, that's just kind of wearing a little bit thin. Because sometimes you know good and well, that wasn't God. It wasn't no more God than anything. God said, I need to marry that person. Yeah, but God knows more about that person than you do. And I know he didn't say that. But anyway. So, so anyway, here's what I'm saying. I'll quit with this just to remind you and to... to Let's take some time. Major decisions, major things. You know, not the route for work, not what clothes to wear. Well, I didn't get to go to work today because I'm praying about what clothes to wear and God didn't say anything. And so until he says, I'm not moving. No, that's not what we're talking about. Because you know what we say about that. God doesn't mind what clothes you wear as long as you wear some. Um... <clears throat> Enough, yes. <laughs> Let's add that to it. <laughs> God doesn't care what clothes you wear as long as you wear enough. Thank you, Willie. <laughs> but the major decisions, the major decisions. Let's make sure that we're beyond mental reasoning and we're at a place to where we can absolutely hear from God and know it's not my goofy brain doing it. It's the voice of the Lord. Amen? Did you get anything out of this tonight? Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Father God, for those things which you have spoken to us. We thank you, Father, and bless you for all that you are doing and shall do. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God, that the decisions that are ahead of us, the God decisions that have to be made, we thank you, Father God, that you are equipping us and leading us and speaking to us. And we thank you, Father God, that we hear your voice, the voice of a stranger we will not follow. Therefore, we will walk in the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name.